All right, here's the problem. Here's the problem. I really want to apply the Bible into my life today. I want to see solutions to the problems I see today in my life and in the world around me. I want to see those solutions in the text of scripture, but so often people, they just rip things out of context. They apply things where it doesn't belong and they start just verse hunting to chop the Bible into sort of incoherent pieces that can be applied in ways that maybe God does not intend. The solution is this, the solution is this, that you do careful Bible study, thoughtful verse by verse study of scripture, and you study to understand what it originally meant. Then the lights start to go on. And when you see what they were dealing with, say in today's text, what Jesus was dealing with the set with the Sadducees and how he confronted them, how he rebuked them and what he pointed out as the problems in their thinking. When we see this, we realize that there are modern counterparts to the Sadducees, just like there are modern counterparts to the Pharisees. And we can apply it rightfully, not just pointing fingers, you're a Sadducee, you're a Pharisee, but rather understanding what was actually wrong back then. And applying it rightly. This excites me. This is a journey I get to go on countless times and I get to go on with you guys as we do verse by verse teaching, which is usually Mondays here at 1 p.m. on the YouTube channel. My name is Mike Winger. I'm a pastor here in Southern California, just uh, teaching the Bible and helping people learn to think biblically about everything. And I mean everything and I mean think and I mean biblically, <laughs> all of those things. So my, my, my case in point today is the Sadducees have a modern counterpart and the modern counterpart of the Sadducees, and I'm gonna build the case, let me just tell it to you, and then I'll build it with you verse by verse. The modern counterpart are liberal Christians or progressive Christians. And I know we're in hot political climate at the moment, but I'm not talking about politics. When I say liberal or progressive, I'm not talking about Democrats at all. I'm talking here about liberal theology, and progressive theology. That's a different issue. Now it's true that usually liberals tend to have also liberal politics, but that's not the issue I'm dealing with today. So modern progressive liberal Christianity is a serious problem. And when you understand how Jesus dealt with the Sadducees, you will know how to identify, and you do need to know this, and deal with modern progressives and the teaching that they've got going on, which might be happening in your own heart. <clears throat> it's entirely possible that in your own heart, in your own mind, in your own teaching you're receiving, you're getting some of the Sadducean type content. So here we are, Mark chapter 12, verses 18 through 27. I'm just going to read through the passage. We'll just read the whole thing. And then we're going to go back over it more carefully, thoughtfully, verse by verse, understand it and understand how to apply it to the problem of modern progressive Christianity, which by the way, is a bigger issue than atheism in the sense that it's affecting the church and the world in a bigger way. All right, Mark 12, 18, some Sadducees who say there's no resurrection came to Jesus and began questioning him saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. Now, this is like a trick question or a trap question for Jesus. Okay, so there's a rule from Moses about marrying the widow of your brother to raise up a kid to his name. Verse 20, there were seven brothers. Here comes their story, their trick. And the first took a wife and died, leaving no children. The second one married her and died, leaving behind no children. And the third, likewise. And so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, when they rise, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. And you could just see them going like, <laughs> take that, Jesus, or riddle me this, Jesus. You know, that you could see the glee that they have with their trick question of Jesus. Verse 24, Jesus responds, it is, uh, is this not the reason you are mistaken that you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. Now this, th this is, now you may not know yet. You'll get it. You'll get it. Just stick with me. How beautiful, clever, and helpful Jesus' encounter with the Sadducees is for our issues we're dealing with today with modern progressives, which I'll give several examples of that as I go on. 
So first off, just thanks everybody for joining me. Um, I'm glad that you're with me for this verse by verse study. Those who are live and those who watch afterwards, it's exciting. You know, we're going through the whole gospel of Mark and here we are in Mark 12. If you want to catch the whole playlist, the entire series is available for free right here on YouTube or on my website or on podcast or wherever else it ends up being. You may one day be watching this somewhere other than YouTube and you'll be like, why is he talking about YouTube? But in short, here's another Jewish group asking another trick question of Jesus and Jesus answers it and rebukes them soundly. And I think that Jesus's rebuttal applies to guys like Rob Bell, Richard Rohr, Brian Zond. And I even think we would apply it to people like, I'll use an example of Barack Obama. I'm not talking about his politics. I'm talking about his religious stuff, his religious views here. I think we would have to apply it to so many people today who are falling into the same patterns of behavior as the Sadducees. So again, not attacking those people, but Jesus wasn't attacking these Sadducees either. What he was doing was correcting them. And I'm hoping to correct some errors here today. So starting in verse 18, let's go verse by verse. Let's understand all this stuff in context. Some Sadducees who say there's no resurrection came to Jesus and began questioning him. We need to know who the Sadducees are. Um, you know, you probably know who the Pharisees are. You probably don't know much about the Sadducees. And part of that's because historically we don't know much about the Sadducees. Also, even in scripture, the Sadducees just don't appear that often. They do appear, you know, you know the name, they appear a few times. We don't know a whole lot about them. What we do know is from, uh, from the Bible, from the New Testament in particular, but we also have content from Josephus, from the Talmud, from Hippolytus, from a couple other sources that just give us little details. We don't have any content directly from the Sadducees, like their writings have not have not survived till this day. And it's a little confusing historically because there's Sadducees in the first century Palestine, but then, you know, 200, 150 years later, it seems like there are no Sadducees in, in Israel at that time. Uh, in I say Israel proper, however you want to, you know, cash this out ge geographically, but they're more like a Samaritan group. So 150 years later, it's like more like the Samaritan group that doesn't seem to be the same as the group Jesus is dealing with. It's kind of confusing historically. But here's what we do know. Here's what we do know. We know that the Sadducees believed there was no resurrection. There is no resurrection. They also believe there's no judgment and there's no afterlife. They also believe there was no angels and there was no spirit. In other words, you would think of this as atheism. It's not atheism, guys. It's in, has, it has a commonality with atheism, but it's not atheism. They believed in God. But they had kind of a physicalist view of our, of our lives in this world. When you physically die, you just stop existing. And there's no future for you after that. There's no time when you'll be brought back into existence. You die with your body. You kind of are your body. That's sort of the view that they're having. Josephus, in his writings, he put it this way, which I got over here. Here's some Josephus. Um, in his writings, he says, but the doctrine of the Sadducees is this, that souls die with the bodies. Souls die with the bodies. So, I mean, that, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. So that, that's their view. This is not a biblical view. This is certainly not a, a Jewish, a, you know, a biblically Jewish view or a Christian perspective that we should have today. But they did call themselves Jews. They called themselves Jews. They said they believed the Bible. They believed the Old Testament. They believed Moses. But they're rejecting it with their theology. And that's just like modern progressives. Now, there's more we know about them. They also rejected fate or God's control over all things. So the Sadducees don't really think, well, you know, God's in control. Well, God's got a plan for this. There isn't really, that's not really a, a doctrine they hold to. Some sources, in, as you read, it's actually difficult. You read different commentaries talking about Sadducees. Um, I think that there's maybe a little bit more guesswork going on there than maybe is, is proper in some cases. So some people say that the Sadducees were deterministic. Um, I think determinism might be a pretty heavy philosophical term to put on the Sadducees. We don't know if they go that far, but there is a lack of believing in the sovereign plan of God in the universe. That is definitely there. Let me tell you something else about the Sadducees, and you may not be surprised. They're a minority view. <clears throat> so they are existent in the first century. They die out by like 70 AD. They're like gone, <clears throat> dead out of Jerusalem. They're not really having an impact. The Pharisee school ends up evolving into rabbinic Judaism after the destruction of the temple. And so some of their views are still existing today. But the Sadducees just die off. So they're a minority view. <clears throat> it was relatively, <coughs> relatively few people were Sadducees, but certain people were Sadducees. And it was, and this is the fourth point. So we know this, they believed in no resurrection, soul dies with the body. They reject fate or God's control. They, they reject, or they're a minority view. That's the third thing. And fourth, they're an arist aristocratic view. The Sadducees were the rich, highly educated people. 
So it's a minority. It, it really starts to feel to me a lot like progressive Christianity. I'll explain why in a minute. But this is the highly educated, sort of more well-off, priestly families. Uh, Josephus put it this way. Um, he added something else to this. He says that because they're a minority view and they're like the highly educated and they're kind of like puffed up in this, in how they really get it. They get the they get the real meaning of, of, of Christianity, or excuse me, Judaism, as I, as I drift into talking about progressives. Um, but Josephus says that some Sadducees, because they were unpopular, because they were a minority, and because they had such offensive theology to Jews, they would pretend they were Pharisees and had Pharisaic views to get more popularity with people. And then in more secret times, maybe with smaller groups of people, they would be honest about the things they didn't really believe that all these Pharisees and all these other Jews were believing. This is exactly like modern progressives, right? Um, Elisa Childers, who... Um, has a her youtube channel is doing really good you guys might consider checking her stuff out i think she has some really valuable content she talks about progressive christianity all the time this kind of liberal christianity she had an experience she relates and it's in her new book as well which i have i have somewhere i have all these books i've got like six bookshelves guys so this is hard to find things sometimes <laughs> but anyway in 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 uh, elisa's you know testimony her story she had a pastor in her local church who was basically a progressive Christian and you got to kind of put Christian in quotes here and in, you know from the pulpit on Sunday he taught things that sounded Christian just like the Sadducees in public would sound like they were very faithful Jewish people but in private he started a little club a little group of people that he was going to re-indoctrinate with progressive Christianity teaching that the resurrection of Jesus is like not really a literal thing he didn't believe in the resurrection teaching that the Bible's not really God's word like in a literal sense it's not an errant certainly not totally reliable and he started trying to like sort of get this cluster of people on his side to try to start changing the church from within. Because Sadducees, generally speaking, there, there's such a deadness in the ultimate faith of Sadducees and progressive Christians that generally speaking, what they do is they infiltrate to the church where it's alive. And they, I'm just being honest here, they plant kind of like a, like a, um, like a parasite. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a pastor who imitates a believing Christian who slowly over time, slowly ekes out my bad theology into my church and changes them. Some will leave, others will change. And now we have a Sadducee church, a progressive Christian church. I think this happens a lot. I think it happens all the time, sadly. Now, some people think the Sadducees did not believe in Moses' law. They didn't believe in the law of Moses. The or They only, excuse me, only held to the law of Moses. Didn't believe in the uh, prophets and, and the writings. Um, so the poetic books and the prophetic books that they did not accept those and the historical books. Uh, they just held to the first five. I don't know that that's actually true. And there's there's one resource in particular I found that helped me on this. If you're doing research on the Sadducees and you want some interesting content, I'm going to recommend you check out, um, and you don't have to read the whole thing for this, but Roger Beckwith's The Old Testament Canon of the New Testament Church. Really interesting tome, uh, and it is a tome. It's rather large. But you only need to read pages 87 to 91. Who knows, maybe you can find it on Google Books and read it for free. But uh, yeah, pages 87 to 91 in chapter 2, he has an interesting discussion on the Sadducees. It was one of the most enlightening things I was able to read on them, and I was reading a lot on these guys. Basically, they didn't reject, it seems, that, that the whole Old Testament was Scripture. But, like modern progressives, they'll acknowledge that it's God's Word or it's Scripture. But they'll just reject things it says, and one of the ways they do it is so unique. It is just like progressives today. They would still say they believed in resurrection. They would just redefine the term. So resurrection meant your kids live on after you die, your children live. That's resurrection. Resurrection is really just you, you know, living on through your offspring. And so they could, so that's how they could in public imitate a faithful Jew. The resurrection, the resurrection, they could preach like that. But then when you got to the nitty gritty of what they meant by those terms, they had gutted it of the heart and centrality of, of the supernatural of what it really meant you live forever. You're raised from the dead physically. And this is, this is, I mean, I could think of guys off the top of my head, right? John Dominic Crossan, who pretends to be a Christian, who pretends to be a bishop. Um, I, I mean, not in a biblical sense, he's not. He even has a little white collar. But this guy says that he doesn't believe in the resurrection and he's offended at the, uh, at the idea. He thinks it's, it's, it's base and it's, it's, it's unsophisticated. Instead, he thinks it's all a metaphor. Jesus's resurrection is a metaphor. And, um, and if you want to offend him even more, tell him that you think, uh, metaphors aren't really very valuable, <laughs> that, that metaphors are not as valuable as the real thing. 
and um, and he'll tell you, but metaphors, a metaphor is more important than the real thing. I've heard him say this several times in debates and his lectures and stuff. And it's funny because if you offered to give him a million dollars and then told him metaphorically, I'll bet he'd be disappointed. <laughs> you know, when, when God gives us a resurrection, then he says, well, metaphorically, I think we'd all be very disappointed in that, understandably. So the Sadducees, like modern progressives, they're not really atheists. They're, 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 they're atheist-ish, right? But they still call themselves Christians. They're religious liberals. They reject essential Christian teachings like judgment, judgment, hell, the exclusivity of Christ, the resurrection. Um, they're often an aristocracy, just like the Sadducees. They're highly educated. There are these pastors who are like, they're, oh, I've been to seminary, you know, if I was, if I was as dumb as you normal pew Christians, then I might still believe, you know, in the resurrection and the Bible's like God's word and that miracles have really happened. But no, I'm, I'm more sophisticated. And they don't say this out loud, but that's, that seems to be what it's coming from. They're often disingenuous sleeper agents because they pretend to affirm Christian teaching. And you have to read three of their books before you get to the one that makes it clear finally they don't believe this stuff. This is Rob Bell, right? When he finally came out and just was honest about the fact that he's just rejecting Christian theology. Before that, he was making like the NUMA videos to try to impersonate. I mean, and I'm, I know these are strong words I'm using here. I think they're accurate words. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying let's go, he's a, he's a witch, burn him. That's not what I'm saying. But getting the discernment to recognize modern Sadducees, like ancient Sadducees, impersonate faithful believers slowly over time they reveal the true their true colors they'll often use scripture to fight scripture just like the sadducees do we'll see in the way they attack the the idea of the resurrection they use moses right they use the pentateuch they use the bible to try to attack biblical teaching and we'll see this from modern sadducees as well god can't send anybody to hell because god is love so i'm going to use the bible to fight the bible here which you know your theology has got to be wrong if you're trying to use the Bible to fight against the teachings of scripture. So there's no genealogical connection between Sadducees and modern progressives. I think it's an ideological connection. I think there's the ideas and the concepts that patterns of bad theology that have crop up in the first century will crop up again and again throughout history. We'll always see them in slightly new forms with different names. And how Jesus responds to these guys is perfect for today. So um, we're going to get into what they said, how their challenge works, how Jesus responds, and how we can apply that into the concepts of modern theological discussion that happens online. You Chances are you as a Christian, you, you're watching YouTube videos, you're being exposed to teachers who are outside your normal circle right now, and you're going to be exposed to some of these guys. You will, you will experience Sadducean stuff, and I would like you to be prepared for that. So today's study is going to hopefully do that. So to understand their trick question, we have to go to the Old Testament and understand something called levirate marriage. So you know about the Sadducees. Now I need to tell you about levirate marriage. This will just take a moment. But in Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 6, we get this. And pay attention. This is how it would work if your brother got married and you're a guy and your brother got married and he died before having kids. This is what you were supposed to do. Let me read it to you, then I'll explain why. And no, no it's not for today, for all believers today, but it was very important for them. When brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, he has no son. That's the important part. The wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Okay, the, the issue here is that God's given uh, Israel a special land. He's given them this land, this inherited land. He gave, promised it to Abraham, gave it to the children of Israel. And if, if this uh, brother marries a woman, she marries somebody else, like maybe a Gentile, maybe someone from another different family in Israel then that land that was the brothers is going to end up being passed on to someone who it doesn't belong to, perhaps to somebody outside of Israel. God wants to preserve the land to the, to the inheritance, to the families that he gave it to. So that's a problem. The solution is her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And here's the duty. Here's the part he has to do. It shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. And um, th then there's a way out of this, right? Like, let's say he doesn't want to take her. Maybe he's already married. And so he has a way to get out of this. Uh, but if he's not married, that's an important way. The first kid gets the name of the, of the deceased brother. He gets the inheritance of that land. It preserves the heritage in Israel because it's all about promised land. This is why it doesn't apply to Gentiles. You don't have a promised land. There's just no application to you except perhaps the general idea of taking care of family, right? That, that, that we, we have a responsibility to take care of our family. 
Um, I think there's a general rule there. So this is what's called levirate marriage. It's not Levite marriage. It's not about Levites getting married. It's lev levirate marriage, which comes from levir, which is the Hebrew for brother. So it's brother marriage uh, or brother-in-law, excuse me, levir's brother-in-law. All right. Now we understand their question. Now when I go to Mark chapter 12, you get why this question makes sense. So here they are. They asked Jesus the following question. Now you're all brainy and you know everything. So you'll be like, I get it. Um, here's the question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. At least one child, actually, not children, but at any rate. Verse 20, there were seven brothers and the first took a wife and died leaving no children. Now they're going to give this weird scenario, right? And they're going to be like, how does this... Prove the resurrection wrong. That's kind of their point. Um, the second one married her and died, leaving behind no children. And the third likewise. And so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For she had um, married all seven. Ha <laughs> ha. And this is, do you get the idea? This is not an argument against the resurrection. It's a challenging question, which is oftentimes how skepticism works. Skepticism towards the Bible, Christianity, it's very often not statements of truth. This is true, therefore. It's often riddles, hard questions, and then you're just supposed to abandon your Christian beliefs because you were given a hard question. And that's what we see very frequently. So this is very much like skepticism today. But the thing to know is this skepticism is coming from religious people. It's not like religious people are incapable of being the wrong kind of skeptic. Um, I want to be skeptical in the sense that I, I have thoughtful, you know, rules about reasoning and logic and that I don't believe things foolishly. But this is not that. This is using scoffing or sarcasm to try to refute things. And I, I like it because it's exactly what we encounter all the time. And Jesus is dealing with it here. So the, the short of it is this. They want to use scripture against scripture to make the conservative belief in the resurrection, which the Pharisees had, which Jesus had, which I have and you have. They want to make it look silly by saying heaven doesn't work because whose wife will she be? There are problems that God cannot solve. And this is just let me give you Barack Obama now. <laughs> so I, I never forgot this. It always stuck in my head because I remember when Barack Obama was, was president and I don't look, this politics is, is, is a secondary issue here. I'm talking about his theology. This is the theology he shared and it was on the topic of same-sex marriage. And he says, because uh, he was advocating at the time for, um, for civil unions, I believe at the time. So Obama says, and I quote, I don't think it should be called marriage but I think it is a legal right that they should have that is recognized by the state. And then listen to this, because my point here is actually not about same-sex marriage. I have four videos on the topic of homosexuality. You're welcome to go look those up. I deal with all this in detail. Listen to his reasoning, though. If people find that controversial, Obama says, then I would just refer them to the Sermon on the Mount, which I think is, in my mind, for my faith, more central than an obscure passage in Romans. That's my view, but we can have a respectful disagreement on that. And I actually, there I, there we agree. We should have respectful disagreement, right? Where we don't say, you can't talk about religion or you can't talk about these issues but and be respectful about it. But here's the disagreement part, right? Where I'm going to use one part of the Bible, Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, to try to refute Romans. So he says Matthew's more central than Romans. Now this is not original with Barack Obama. Barack Obama is just a very loud voice. Everybody's listening to him because he, was, he had the time as the president of the United States. But what he's saying is the things progressives have been saying for many, many years. You know, my theology is more about than it is about this. It's more about, and they quote some idea of, of, in the scripture that's very palatable to our culture, than it is about this. And they refer to some idea that is not palatable to our culture. It's more about love than it is about hate. And they relate hate must be uh, not approving of same-sex marriage or something like that. And so this is this is the kind of thing we're going to get all the time. When say people say, well, I don't believe in, in judgment, in final judgment, because I believe God's love is more about restoring us than punishing us. And it's the more about stuff. And, and they're going to say, you know, 
Jesus. The resurrection doesn't work because, you know, the rules about marriage don't 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 function well in this eternal state of heaven. It just doesn't work. And so they're trying to kind of use one thing, the rules about marriage here, to fight the teaching on the resurrection. The only, only safe Christian position is to believe the Sermon on the Mount and the Book of Romans. And this is the thing you need to know. When you get the sense that somebody wants you to use a biblical truth to reject another biblical truth, it's time to run away from that pastor or that teacher or that person. We take all of scripture. I will believe all of what God said. And the minute I start taking one of the things God says and I fight against something else God said with that thing, I am in reinventing Christianity in my own image. And that's a scary thing. So Jesus' response is going to be fantastic. Jesus says to them, let's look at verse 24. Actually, here, I'll show you the cat cam real quick, because guess what? We have a cat. <laughs> there she is. She just happened. Ah, oh, there's zoom in. There's the pox. I just wanted you to see. There's Moxie. Moxie, Mox pox, pox, Mox in a box, chicken pox, chicken face, fish breath. We call her lots of different things. At any rate, here is the text of scripture. As everybody's like, I'm leaving. Stop talking about your cat. Verse 24, Jesus' response to them, brilliant. We're going to unpack it thoughtfully. Jesus says, is this not the reason you are mistaken? That you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God. There's two things they don't get. They don't get the Bible and they don't understand God's power. Those are the two things. That is a pretty big rebuke. And I would say that applies blanket to Rob Bell and Brian Zond. And, and sadly, in some cases, we have some, I should say, half application to people like Greg Boyd, or in some cases, even some of the, some of the hyper-charismatic people who are moving towards some of the progressive teachings that are going on in our culture right now, that there is, uh, they're not full-on Sadducees, but they're like, they're flirting with nothing, if nothing else. And the thing they don't get is the scriptures they're, they're misinterpreting the scripture. It should be obvious if we read it. We should be like, that's clearly not what God meant when he wrote that. And they're not understanding the power of God because they think a, a riddle, a, a, a philosophical riddle will just undo God's ability to give us eternal life or to accomplish his purposes. It's, it's, it's weird how effective riddles are at getting people to doubt their beliefs. But riddles aren't truths. They're riddles. And you don't know the power of God if you think God can't overcome those things. Then he says, for when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So he's, here's what you didn't understand about the scripture, right? That when people rise from the dead, they're, they're like angels in heaven. Or maybe it's the power of God they don't get because they don't realize that in the resurrection, we have an exalted state. We're, we're not living like this. It's something greater. It's something better. We're like the angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Then he goes on to say, He's not, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You're greatly mistaken. Let's unpack this now. Their trick question is, right? She marries seven brothers. Whose wife is she in the resurrection? And <clears throat> Jesus' answer is so clever and so needful not only because he just answers their question, but he does it in a very targeted fashion. And th this is good wisdom here. <clears throat> when you're encountering a progressive, you need to find the things that they are committed to in order to help answer their questions, right? If they're committed to justice and they're using the concept of justice to subvert Christian teaching, what you need to do is show them that <clears throat> the very concept of justice is being misunderstood by them so that they can still be a champion of justice, but realize it's pointing them in a different direction than they thought it was. Uh, that kind of thing. So this is clever because the Sadducees, one of the reasons why they were rejecting the resurrection is because of their view of the Pentateuch as being sort of the five books of Moses. They would hold it up in a higher fashion than they would, while they still held all scripture to be scripture, it seems, they held up the Pentateuch in a higher fashion than they did the other texts of scripture. And some people do this today. Some people try to hold up the Gospels as if that's my whole Christianity and then the, the epistles like Romans and stuff like that, like that's sort of secondary, right? That's what Obama did. Same kind of thing there. But it's all God's word. We need to take it all. But what Jesus does is he quotes from the Pentateuch, from the first five books of Moses. He quotes from there to prove them wrong. So he takes their strongest point and he attacks them on their strongest point. That's really interesting. Now, here's why I, I love it 
applying it today. Modern theologians do the same thing the Sadducees did. And they reckon that in the Old Testament, the concept of the resurrection and the concept in particular of an afterlife isn't really showing up until like the time of the exile, right? When the temple was destroyed and they're carried away, like Ezekiel's time. They're saying that this is like when the resurrection first starts really showing up. Meaning that they would deny that their resurrection and afterlife are actually taught in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy in those books. Right? They're going to they're going to say, or they'll say people inserted it later or something, which is a whole other debate. But modern theologians do the same thing, and Jesus' answer refutes both groups. It refutes the Sadducees, and it refutes many modern theologians who I would maybe even a majority. My guess is it's a majority who want to say that. We don't have, I mean, I mean, N.T. Wright, who I respect in many, many ways, he would say the same thing, that the Old Testament doesn't, my understanding is, that he's teaching is the Old Testament doesn't really bring up resurrection until much, much later. And and I should say afterlife, like that you just continue existing and you could have a future, good, good, a good living future after your death, that that is like just a new thing that comes later on. Well, Jesus quotes Exodus 3, 6 to support the teaching of the afterlife. And if my Lord Jesus is quoting Exodus to support the afterlife and a theologian is telling me that the Old Testament in Exodus doesn't do that, then I'm thinking I'm siding with Jesus here. I mean, if, now if you're not a Christian, fine. I don't really care what you think about what the Bible thinks about the afterlife. But if you're a believer, you should be taking Jesus' word here. You should be like, well, obviously, many modern theologians are just wrong. If you think the afterlife is only coming much later in the Old Testament, Jesus disagrees. And he knows God's intention when God's talking to Moses. There's other indications in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, that there is an afterlife. I'll just give you one of them, and it's in Genesis 5.24. And I'm going to go to, I'm going to Genesis. Look, I'm Genesis chapter 5. Like, that's kind of early. That's kind of early, right? Genesis 5.24, it says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. This is one of the most puzzling and interesting passages in the book of Genesis because you have Enoch who's just taken by God. He's, he's, it's like he's, like he's raptured by God. He's just taken. He's effectively just taken from earth without dying. And I mean, you know, commentators are going to agree Enoch doesn't die in Genesis 5. And part of the reason for it, because you could say, well, maybe God took him is a euphemism for he died. But that's not the case because in Genesis 5, all you have is a long list of people who live and then they die. And then they die. And then they die. And it's just, it's just we get it over and over again. And he died. That's that's all we get. And he died. You know, Kenan lived this long and then he died. Mahalalel and then he died. Jared and then he died. And you get to Enoch. And he doesn't die. He walks with God. He has a relationship with God. And then God just takes him. Because of his relationship, he has this afterlife. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. And so here we have in Genesis 5, there's, there's these, this idea of the afterlife. Uh, there's other intimations in Genesis and other places in the Old Testament as well. But what I want to ask is the question, how does Jesus quote the Old Testament in particular? Um, Christ is quoting Exodus 3, 6, and he does it in a fashion you might not expect. Because this is where God, God says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, chronologically, God's saying this to Moses many, many years after Abraham, like 400 years later. So here's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all their, all, they're dead, all their, all their lives have ended physically. But God says he's still their God. And the simple explanation is that Jesus is saying the ongoing nature of God's relationship with them, I am their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that that means that they have an ongoing life. And Jesus's interpretation is given in Mark because God is not the God of the dead. He's not Abraham's God if Abraham is dead. Maybe he was Abraham's God, not he is Abraham's God. Now, this is uh, bigger and probably would have more impact on a Jewish mindset because the Jewish mindset realizes that the phrase God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that threefold phrase is very important for establishing Israel's current relationship with God because Israel's relationship with God isn't based upon ultimately upon their goodness. It's based upon a promise that was made to the patriarchs. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God promises them his faithfulness. And the ongoing promises of God to Israel are based upon God's faithfulness to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And to say that they're dead and have ceased to exist, it's, it's like almost threatening the identity of Israel. So the Jew would have probably in the first century felt Jesus's like reasoning and scriptural like argumentation more strongly. 
than many of us do today because we just have that that different mindset side note this means that even in genesis even in exodus that a relationship with god is the context in which one has everlasting life right because abraham's the friend of god and then years later god's like i'm still his god and jesus is like because he's still because god's still abraham's god abraham's still alive why because we relationally have eternal life this is the same thing in christ you abide in him you know him you trust in him it's a relationship with god that means eternal life like enoch in genesis 5 he walked with god relationally and then he was not because god took him so there's this beautiful parallel from genesis down to revelation that we're we're not just living forever we're living forever in context of a relationship with god beautiful now here's a side note because let's talk about mormonism for a second um in LDS theology, uh, Latter-day Saints, in their teaching, they have a, a teaching about the afterlife where marriage does continue. So they believe that if you're married in the temple, if you get married inside one of their temples, like we have a temple down in San Diego, down south of me, uh, there's a temple in Salt Lake. They have several temples around the world that they've built beautiful, magnificent buildings. I mean, they are gorgeous, but I mean, nobody knows how to whitewash a sepulcher like Satan because... The substance isn't there, so the look has to be there. So I think Satan makes the best buildings for that very reason. Uh, it's to compensate. But but the beautiful, gorgeous buildings, you go in there, and if you get married, if I'm Mormon, and my wife is Mormon, and we go into the temple, and we have a letter of recommendation from our local bishop, and then we can give our vows, and we get, we get married in the temple. It's a special religious ceremony where you get, quote, sealed for time and all eternity. That phrase is important in Mormon teaching. You're sealed for time and all eternity. Now, the result of this, if you're a good Mormon, and if you die and you become exalted to godhood, and you become a god, that's Mormon theology, you can become a god, as as much of a god as God Almighty in the Old Testament, right? That god, you can become like that. That god used to be a man like you, and you could become a god like him. So, which is, actually, that idea first came from Satan in the Garden of Eden. But, but if you become a god, then you, if you're a man, with your wife, you procreate in heaven. And she keeps making babies, making babies, millions and billions and billions of babies. And then you can finally populate your own planet with your own spirit children. And you can kind of do Earth 2.0. You can do like the whole thing God did with Earth. You can do that again with your family. This is why in modern Mormonism, they're, they're actually still practice polygamy. It's just not in, in the physical, like you don't have two wives at a time on Earth, but you can have as many wives as possible in heaven. This is what Joseph Smith did when he was marrying women who even in some cases were already married. He was claiming that guy's wife for his, this is Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism. I know there's a lot of info here. He's marrying some guy's wife for the future so that when he died, she'd be one of his many wives that he could sleep with in heaven and she could just be perpetually pregnant. Um, so this is a problem, right? If LDS theology teaches these things and Jesus says there is no marriage in heaven, then you've got to have an explanation for this. And this is one of the many points in which LDS theology just comes into conflict with the teachings of the Bible. So they have a couple options. I actually looked them up. I thought, I wonder what LDS theologians, apologists are saying about this. One of the options they'll take to get around Jesus' teaching that there is no marriage in heaven is <clears throat> that eternal marriage is only for good people. And Jesus wasn't saying that the, that the good Mormons or the good faithful people who God approves of, that they would have no marriage. Jesus was only saying the Sadducees won't have marriage in heaven. And so this was, this was probably the more common way of getting around this passage that I found online as I was looking for how they might explain it. Maybe there's other ways I didn't see. This is the one I found <clears throat> more commonly. <clears throat> uh, the problem with this view is that in Mark 12, Jesus doesn't give the explanation that it's just the Sadducees that aren't going to get this marriage experience. Instead, it's just everybody. He just says, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Right? And, and, and he's just talking about the resurrection in general. This is just a general thing regarding the fact that the dead rise again. It's just a generally general statement about everybody who rises. So Jesus speaks about those who rise and those who experience a positive afterlife experience that there just is no marriage. So that doesn't apply. Um, no angels. Uh, no spouses, sorry, no spouses. They're like the angels. We'll get to that in a second. Now, a second Mormon defense of this passage is from the LDS apostle James E. Talmadge. Uh, Mormonism has apostles. They have 12 apostles. They think that they have one prophet and 12 apostles. They have a president of the church, and these are like the spiritual leaders. I mean, they have, they're a very centralized 
power uh, religion, right, where they have these 12 guys that are literally considered the 12 apostles of today. Well, back in the day, last century, James Talmadge was one of the apostles. And he said the following, the Lord's, and see if you can pick, pick out how he's reinterpreting this. The Lord's meaning was clear that in the resurrected state, there can be no question among the seven brothers as to whose wife for eternity the woman shall be, since all except the first had married her for a duration of mortal life only and primarily for the purpose of perpetuating immortality the name and family of the brother who first died. This is in his book, Jesus the Christ. It's page 548. Talmadge is saying that the opposite of what Jesus is saying, the exact opposite, he's saying, oh, she's the wife of the first husband and the rest only married her temporarily. She'll be married to the first husband forever. Who cares what Jesus says? We have our own answer. And this is exactly um, what LDS theology does over and over again with the text of scripture. It's not that hard to notice it if you're paying attention. Next question I have is this, because as I study the Bible, I just write out questions I have in a passage. Jesus says, we're like the angels in heaven. How much am I like the angels in heaven? Is it just in relation to marriage or is it like I'm an angel in heaven? And here, I think we have other scriptures that help us out, but we'll start with what Jesus says. Jesus says we are like angels in heaven. He doesn't say we are angels in heaven. I think it's bad theology to think that we become angels, that the nature of our being changes from being humans made in the image of God to angels. We still have physical bodies, unlike the angels. We have physical bodies that are we're resurrected with new glorified bodies, and so we're not like the angels in that regard. So we're only like the angels in the sense that we don't get married. That's what Jesus's point is here. He's telling us we're like the angels in that we aren't going to get married just like they don't get married. But in nature, we're different than angels. Hebrews 1.14, it says, Of the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Right? They're ministering spirits. We're those inheriting salvation. We're of a different class of being. We're lower than the angels now, but later on, in the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 6, 3 tells us we'll be judging angels. So we'll be over angels. So we're, we don't take the place of angels. We have our, our own place in the uh, the plan of God. So this means that like if you're at a funeral service and somebody's like, well, um, and I, I've, I've been there. I've heard this before. It's like God just needed another angel. This is probably, I mean, okay, they're wrong. Like that theology is not accurate. But this is the worst, worst time in the world to correct somebody's theology. Like, please, when someone's grieving and they say, God need another angel, don't be like, well, we're like angels, but we're not angels. Like, just, just hug them and cry with them and tell them I miss them too, you know? And, and, and I know God has, has a eternal life for them. Give them some, some, some of that hope and courage. A funeral is a bad time to split hairs. Good reminder, when people uh, make intellectual mistakes because of emotional troubles they're going through, it's better to answer their emotional troubles than their intellectual mistakes. When people make intellectual mistakes because of just intellectual mistakes, that's when it's good. In a Bible study like this, when there's no pressure, when there's not a bunch of emotions attached, to be able to correct some of those things, things is a good time. Verse 27, Mark 12, 27, <clears throat> finally, Jesus says, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly, greatly mistaken. And this is my word for those who are believing in the, um, the progressive liberal tendencies, theologically speaking, to de-supernaturalize the Bible, I will give you some examples. Some of the, and, this, and these, these are always the theologians that get interviewed by like History Channel or Discovery or on any of those stations, they always interview the liberal, there are conservative, good conservative theologians out there, but no, 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 they're not getting calls. They're not getting calls. They want the liberals, right? And so what I've actually heard, not kidding, as an explanation for how to de-supernaturalize the Bible is that, for instance, when Jesus multiplied the fishes and loaves, maybe you've heard this one too. I'd like to know if you've heard this one. When Jesus multiplied the fishes and loaves, he wasn't actually doing a miracle there. The miracle was human compassion. And, this, and the story they tell goes like this. There's a little boy who has five loaves and two small fish and everybody has food, but they're hiding it because they're selfish right? They're hiding their food and they're like, oh, I don't have any food. And they're going to eat it quietly on their own or something. But this little boy gives all he has. And the crowd's like, oh, look at this lad. Such a good, oh, I feel bad. I'm going to pull out my food that I've been hiding and I'm going to offer it too. And everyone starts offering the food they're hiding. And lo and behold, 
Everyone eats till they're full and there's still food left. It's a miracle of human compassion, right? It's, it's, it's like, it's like the little boy becomes, becomes tiny Tim, right? <laughs> he, he's like, Hey, Mr. Scrooge, you know, and he's, and he's changing, he's changing Mr. Scrooge as the idea. Um, that's not what scripture says, right? Like I would say, A, they don't know the scripture because if you read the passage in context, there's no room for that interpretation. B, they don't know the power of God because they really think they have to reinterpret it because they just don't think God's going to ever do a miracle like that. Let me give you another example. Probably my favorite example of a terrible liberal theologian version of de-supernaturalizing the Bible to take the miracles away. Jesus walking on water. And I saw this, I think it was on the History Channels where I, where I saw a guy doing this. I wish I had written down the name of the guy. I would, I would tell you. But Jesus walking on water. And, the, and then the, the, the really smart Sadducee says, well, here's what probably happened. You know, Galilee is, I mean, before I tell you his explanation, let me describe to you Galilee, okay? I've been to Israel. I've been to Galilee. Uh, Israel's climate is a lot like California, if you've ever been out here. It's desert-like uh, in some areas. Some regions are more desert-like. A lot of it, though, is not. And Galilee's not, right? It's, it's green. A lot of the time, the grass is nice and green. It's a lake, giant lake area. And there's no, I'll just say there's no sand dunes and there's no desert on Galilee. Okay, that's, it's a nice area. Here's the guy's theory. Well, you know, we have the story of Jesus walking on the water. But what really happened here, because Israel's very much a desert, the guy doesn't even know what Israel looks like. He's obviously never looked at photos of Israel. <laughs> he goes, because Israel's a desert. Um, you know, deserts cause mirages. Mirages are just natural occurrences. Jesus was probably walking out on like a sand bar there and there's desert and heat and hot and cold air and so it's a mirage and it looked like Jesus was walking on water and so that explains Jesus walking on the water and this is liberal theology in a nutshell make something up and pretend it's true because I don't believe the Bible and I don't believe God's power to be able to do these things um that's what I've seen a lot of in my experience and you will you have seen it you will see it it's just it's just always a recurring thing the crazy thing about this explanation is the guy hasn't even thought long enough about his own explanation to decide how it is that Peter gets out of the water, walks on the water, waves come, he goes into the water, and Jesus pulls him out of the water. Like, the only explanation I can think is it must have been quicksand, right? Like, Jesus walks, I mean, Peter walks, he's a fisherman, of course he lives there, but he doesn't know it's a mirage because he's a moron, and he's walking on the, on the, on the sand. He's like, wow, I'm walking on the sand. He takes his eyes off Jesus. At that moment, he just happened to step into the quicksand. Lord Jesus, help me. And Jesus pulls him up out of the sand. Like, I guess that's what it is. Other people, they, they try to de-supernaturalize everything in the Bible. Um, this is just Sadducee stuff. Now, it's true. Some of the miracles in scripture probably involved God just using natural events. I'll give you an example. The Red Sea crossing, it says in the text, right? Because you want to know the scripture. It says in the text that there was a, a, a strong wind that blew all night long on the Red Sea. So the wind seemed to have a causal effect in this whole splitting of the waters. It may not have looked like we get in the images where we have the water piled up um, quite literally. You know, as, as, as it may have just been the water was pushed back quite a ways downstream. Uh, that may be the thing. I'm not sure of all the details. But there was some wind involved. There could have been some naturalistic explanation that was included in there. It would have been the timing of God that was miraculous. But if you want to say that all of, like when, when Moses throws the staff down, it becomes a serpent. Please give me a naturalistic explanation of this. Like either you believe in the power of God or you start coming up with Sadducee solutions to biblical problems. And that's the false assumption of naturalism. And Jesus, his rebuke to those guys is the same as the rebuke to those who de-supernaturalize the Bible. You do not know the scripture and you do not know the power of God. Don't start with your gut reasoning about what you think is possible. Start with scripture and the power of God. And this will impact your theology on hell, heaven, sincere people, you know, being judged before God because you're going to base it on scripture, not based on your gut and just the, just the, the, the trends of pop thinking. You believe in what God says and you know his power. I've heard people reject the Bible because of the riddle. Here's a Sadducee riddle for you. How could God use fallible human beings to make a perfect book? People are fallible, so therefore I don't trust the Bible. And not only is this self-refuting, because A, a human came up with that idea, didn't he? 
that you can't trust the Bible because humans did it, but human a human made the idea that you can't trust the Bible. So wait a minute, I can't trust myself that I can't trust the Bible. But wait a minute, I discovered that I can't trust myself. So I can't trust that I can't trust myself that I can't trust the Bible. And you just go into this, you could just you just tell you implode. Um, anything that's self-refuting needs to be abandoned right away. But Obviously, you don't know the power of God, that he can draw a straight line with a crooked stick, that he could, he could use us, the crooked sticks, he could use humans uh, through his inspiration and his sovereignty and his providence to write exactly what he wants. Maybe you have a hard time understanding the Trinity. I've seen a Sadducee attitude towards the Trinity as well, where people reject the Trinity because they say, you know, I know the Bible teaches it. And some, some people don't think the Bible teaches it. I think they're mistaken, but they're not, in, they're not what I'm talking about right now. For those who say, I don't believe the Trinity because I don't understand it, right? I know that it says like Jesus is God, yet he's man. And Jesus is also, he's not the father. He's the son. He's not the father, but he's still God. Okay, I can say all that and I think it's all taught in scripture, but I don't believe it because I don't fully understand it. I think that this is, you don't know, you don't know the power of God. <laughs> like you, you just think that if you can't understand something, it therefore shouldn't be believed. Let me give you some examples of how ridiculous this is. This camera I'm looking at right now, this Panasonic GH5S, I do not understand how it works, but I have no trouble believing that it works. And it's not like it stops working because I don't understand it. Like, I don't understand how calculus works, but I have no trouble believing that calculus works, right? I, I don't, maybe you don't understand how the Trinity works, but you shouldn't have trouble understanding that it's what scripture is teaching you about the nature of God. And the Sadducee mentality is to think that you're, you're, your tough question proves something wrong instead of realizing that it just proves our own ignorance. When they asked about marriage, they should have thought, I guess I'm just ignorant about how God's going to work out heaven for us. Instead, they thought, resurrection is not true. You should say, I guess I'm just ignorant about exactly the nature of who God is. I just don't know some things rather than the Trinity must be false. Like th that's, that's what I'm talking about. The opinions and gut feelings I have aren't the authority on the truth of God. It's the word of God revealed to us giving us the truth of God. Let me give you another example. This one's a little bit harder to swallow. It's closer to home, I think, for some of us. Rob Bell, who I was harping on earlier today, um, not because I'm personally upset with the guy, uh, just because he's leading large numbers of people into very painful uh, errors that are hurting them, including himself. Uh, I, I feel bad for the guy. But one of the things that he's done is he brings out a video where he says, like, Gandhi's in hell? Are you? And he's trying to challenge the idea of hell. So he's like, Gandhi's in hell? You know this? How do you know this? Who told you that Gandhi was in hell? And he asks all these rhetorical questions. But he never once says, like, what does the Bible teach about these issues? Right? So we, we take a very emotive thing. Like, Gandhi is like a cultural icon. People don't know much about Gandhi. They just know he's a cultural icon. We have like a rose-colored view of Gandhi. We think much more highly of him than we probably should. Um, Gandhi himself, if you look into his actual history, the man would actually like sleep, literally physically sleep with various women. He would go to bed every night in naked with women he's not married to laying next to him because he wanted to tempt himself, right? This is part of Gandhi's sad history, okay? He had some good things. He had some bad things. He was, he was not a perfect man. Um, but if Gandhi knew the gospel of Christ, if he'd heard the gospel, rejected it, um, and, and, and holding to a lot of false beliefs and re ultimately rejecting God, then he's going to stand and, and have to pay for the sins he committed. Yeah, that's what scripture teaches. But Rob Bell doesn't know the scripture. He's intentionally, I think at this point, doesn't know it. He maybe knew, one, knew it once, didn't like it, decided to reinterpret it like the Sadducees. And now he's appealing to the emotional response of the name of Gandhi as a way of trumping what the clear teaching of scripture on the topic is. And this is what progressives do all the time nowadays. I think Jesus utterly spits in the face of progressive theology. The reinterpreting of Christianity to make it more palatable to not just modern sensibilities, but more palatable to the idea that people aren't really sinful. That's the idea. That's the, that, that might be one of the core ideas in progressive theology right now, is that people just aren't that bad, which Jesus would absolutely re refute. And I could say, well, you don't know the scriptures if you think those things, that we don't need the grace of God desperately and that there aren't consequences for our sins ultimately if we reject that. Jesus believed in judgment. Jesus believed in hell. Talked about it more than anybody else in the Bible. Jesus believed in the supernatural stuff, like God speaking through a burning bush. I mean, he says it in this very passage. He believes God spoke through a burning bush. I mean, he was the one who spoke through the burning bush. 
check out my video on um, on uh, Jesus in the Old Testament, my series on that, if you want to see a study on that topic. The theology of Jesus protects us from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And here I'm going to, I'm going to wind this up with some payoff from the last couple studies in the Mark series. I want to tell you where Jesus agreed with the Pharisees, disagreed with the Pharisees, and where he agreed and disagreed with the Sadducees because it will help us navigate the troubling waters of theology today. First, the Pharisees. I'm going to give you four, maybe five areas where Jesus agreed with the Pharisees. Did you know he agreed with them on a lot? A lot, actually. Then we'll talk about where he disagreed with them. So one, Jesus agreed with the Pharisees that there's a supernatural worldview that involves God, judgment, uh, you know, eternal life that involves these, these types of things that the progressives often are wanting to shy away from or turn into metaphors. Jesus agreed with the Pharisees on that. He agreed with them on the afterlife and the resurrection, the afterlife and the resurrection, including judgment. He agreed with them on the inspiration and authority of the entire Old Testament, right? Jesus doesn't unhitch Andy Stanley from the Old Testament, not remotely, neither do, does the New Testament. We have a fulfillment theology, not a disconnecting theology, right? It's not unhitching. It's about fulfillment and understanding that um, to be able to apply all of scripture, but he believes all of the Bible is God's word. Jesus has a, believes, agrees with the Pharisees that, and this is really cool, that there's a messianic focus of the Old Testament, right? Jesus says, all the scripture, it wrote of me. This was like a, more of a Pharisee view of things, that there's this sort of plan of God bringing about the ultimate Messiah. So that, there's agreement with the Pharisees on four points. You could even say on a fifth point that Jews would, should be careful to obey all of the law because he approved even of them tithing their, um, their mint and cumin and stuff. He doesn't deride them for that. He derides them for other things. So three areas of disagreement. Three areas of disagreement Jesus has with the Pharisees. One, traditions as doctrines. Traditions as doctrines. They have traditions of man. They teach them as though they're doctrines of God. Number two, the authority of the seat of Moses. And I'm just recapping because I recently taught, I did a video that the thumbnail said, thumbnail said, uh, what if Jesus met the Pope? And I talked about how the Pharisees are like, the modern Pharisees are really like the Roman Catholic Church. Um, the teaching of the church. I'm not trying to attack Catholics. It's just the reality of the situation. So the authority of the seat of Moses, Jesus disagrees with them. Um, the way Jesus talks about the seat of Moses or them sitting with that, you know, the way modern Roman Catholics sit in the chair of Peter, they, Jesus speaks about it like there's a lot of responsibility there, but not a lot of authority, not as much authority as they think. Major responsibility, less authority. The Pharisees thought they had massive authority and Jesus refutes that. And then the self-righteousness of the Pharisees. And this isn't just you're self-righteous because you're annoying. Like sometimes we say people are self-righteous because they're just annoying us. That's not really what, we, what that means. Um, but rather the idea that you can contribute to your salvation through your good works. That's the idea. Your salvation is going to be achieved through your works being added to whatever God's doing. And Jesus disagrees with those three areas. And I would say this is exactly the modern Roman Catholic teaching on the topic. Maybe not from Pope Francis, who I'm not sure how Catholic he is. Um, I know I'm starting a lot of fires today. I don't mean to. I'm just trying to cover a lot of material quickly. But um, but the but the modern Roman Catholic Church and the, and the traditional Catholic teaching on these things is they have traditions, they have doctrines of men. They believe in the authority of the chair of Peter way beyond anything that it could, could even possibly be. And they have a teaching about works contributing to salvation in a way that is very pharisaical. Okay, what about the, the Sadducees? So if the modern Pharisees probably best represented by Roman Catholicism. Sadducees, probably best represented by modern progressives who are kind of unbelieving believers. There's like a mixture of belief and unbelief in one bundle. How much did Jesus agree with the Sadducees? Well, unlike the Pharisees, there's basically zero points of agreement between Jesus and the Sadducees. Things that are uniquely believed by this group, Jesus doesn't hold to any of them. None. And I think I'm the same way. I think that with Catholics, there's many, and I know I have Catholics who watch me, and I'm sure you cringe as I share some of these things. I share them because I sincerely believe these things to be true, and I hope you'll consider them. But we agree with each other on a lot of stuff, don't we? Right? The, the deity of Christ, the nature of God, re reality of miracles, the reality of the spiritual world, demons, the, the, the need for Jesus as Savior. Like, there's so many things we agree on, and like the, Jesus and the Pharisees, like, I'm like, I agree with you on so much. Not like I'm Jesus. I'm not. But there's a lot of agreement there. But with the Sadducees or with progressive Christians, I find that it's like I agree with them on nothing. Every element of the Christian faith is twisted and changed and altered until it becomes a metaphor 
an empty metaphor that ultimately isn't Christian. Jesus just disagreed on the Sadducees in every area that we know anything about the Sadducees. And I feel that way about many modern progressives. In other words, a lot of the fundies got it right. Okay. The, there are there are certain fundamental truths in Christianity. And while I'm not like a fundamental in many senses, if you just want to use the lexical meaning of the word, like you, you hold to fundamental truths of, you know, the, the, the judgment, heaven, hell, God, salvation through Jesus, miracles, the spiritual realm, all that stuff. Yep. That's me. And guess what? That was Jesus too. Now, if you're interested in more details on progressive Christianity, which I think is, is a big issue, you could check out Elisa Childers' YouTube channel. That's something you could look up. But also, I have a video I've linked down below, and I've put in the first comment in this teaching video, which is from Brian Zond, my, my review or my refutation, actually, of Brian Zond. He's one of the best examples of a modern progressive, how he uses Christian language to teach unchristian things. And I have a video where I point by point go through those teachings. It will better equip you because you might be looking for more examples. You may want to follow this up. This is a major issue today. There are still Sadducees. There are more today than there were in the day of Jesus. And because of the internet, the content from them is spreading even more quickly. And just like the Sadducees back in the day, they use double speak. They use Christian terminology, but they don't mean what you mean or what Jesus meant or what Paul meant when he said those things. And because of that, maybe you need to be equipped. Well, I have a refutation of progressive teaching down below that you could check out and I hope that you will. Otherwise, I will see you guys on Friday. Friday, I'm taking your questions. Um, I'll probably have another video this week as well. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'd like to close us out in prayer. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you because as we study and understand the details of the text of scripture, it does apply so well into our lives today. Who knew that as we just read about the, the Sadducees that we would see whole movements going on today that 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 we're protected from by the words of Jesus to this group back then. We pray that we would be those who hold fast to the truth of scripture, those who know the word of God and who know the power of God and who are not dissuaded by trick questions or by skeptical snide remarks, but we would be those who hold fast to those things which Jesus gave us to hold fast to. We pray for courage and we pray for wit and wisdom so that when we encounter Sadducees in our time, we would be able to answer as cleverly and thoughtfully and persuasively as Jesus did. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's all. Thank you all. See you Friday, 1 o'clock p.m. California time.